Oh, that was when awesome. I fumbled the ball a little bit. Because I didn't see the ball. It <laughs> made it almost disaster. It's on now. It's on now. We're good to go. All right. Praise God. We're slowly on now. All right. Hallelujah. Okay. Well, praise God. We're, we're still we're studying the book of Daniel. We're preparing for whenever we're going to get to the book of Revelation. So the book of Daniel has a lot of information in it. Um, and we're just going through, you know, chapter by chapter. And some chapters are going to be more relevant to the book of Revelation. But I will say this. That um, when it comes to the book of Daniel, we're going to look at it through the eyes of eschatology or end time events is the way we're going to look at the book of Daniel. So we're going to try to extract from every chapter that we read and look at it, try to connect it to that concept. Because the whole, uh, the whole chapter of uh, the whole book of, of Daniel is written to describe the latter days and to describe the end times. Okay? And so that's how we're looking at it. So we're just going to go ahead and read this whole chapter. And uh, and as we read through, then we're going to kind of just break down a Does few of the points. What Daniel happened? chapter 4, can you see that? Yes, it's Daniel chapter 4. And we're going to start reading in, uh, start reading verse 1, and we're going to read the whole chapter. Y'all ready? Here we go. Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all people, nations, and languages, that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God has wrought toward me. Just real quick, this is obviously coming from King Nebuchadnezzar. He's the one that's talking. And what he's doing is he's describing and he's letting us know what God has shown him. Okay? And so, now listen, I gotta tell you, in this chapter, God humbles Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? And so he's speaking about this after the fact, after he's already been through things, and now he's humble, okay? We'll talk a little bit more about who Nebuchadnezzar is, but right now let's just go ahead and read through. So then in verse 3 it says, How great are his signs, he's talking about God, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house. And flourishing in my palace, I saw a dream which made me afraid. And the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, and I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. Just a real quick side note, just so that we understand that we're all on the same page, and I'm sure you already know this. God's not okay with magicians and conjurers and soothsayers, right? That's that's the occultic world. That's the magic, the world of magic. This, you know, I would call it occultic deception. But that was the empire. That was the Babylonian empire. You got to understand. That the only people that knew the one true God was the nation of Israel that God had created out of Abraham. All these other nations had been had been taught to worship pagan gods, false gods, fallen angels, demon spirits. Whether it was, you know, and it all started with the Babylonian mystery religion. And we've talked about that before. But this is what was going on in the empire. And so listen, you, you can about imagine if, if one of you guys... That was, let's just say you were on fire for the Lord, you were filled with the Holy Spirit, amen, and you were a witness. Let's just say that you're a witness for the Lord, and that you're at the workplace, and you're over there ministering to people, right? And you're letting people know about the goodness of God. And then all of a sudden, uh, you, were, you, were, you were rounded up, you and three other of your friends, okay? And, and, and y'all were brought to some some camp kind of thing where where nobody really knew the Lord, all right? But then, or you were brought to another country where nobody really knew the Lord, and they were worshiping false gods, and they were engaged in false religion. But you knew the truth, and you and your friends started in this big old mass of people to try to tell them the truth. Now listen, there's a lot of mindsets, and God works through people, but there's a lot of old mindsets about religion and false religion that people are connected to, and it takes time for God to break through. I personally believe that Daniel had a very big and profound effect on both the Babylonian Empire and the Persian Empire because he rose to heights um, that, you know, but listen, again, you gotta, we got to understand 
so people are so oftentimes so far away from understanding the truth of God and that the majority of the world does not really understand the truth of God. And so I just wanted you to be aware of that, that they still got all this stuff going on in the Babylonian Empire, even though Daniel is rising up and he's becoming a leader. So it says, but at the last, Daniel came before me, whose name was Belteshazzar according to the name of my God. So he had named Daniel after his God. Um, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians. I don't know that Daniel would have wanted that title, to be perfectly honest with you. But what happened was, was if you'll remember the story when in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream then also, and nobody could interpret the dream. And so they brought in all the magicians, all the conjurers, all of the soothsayers, and he told, and he told him, he said, listen, you, you're going to have to tell me, tell me the dream I had. Then you're going to have to interpret it or else you're going to die. And if you remember, nobody could do that. And Daniel was able to do that. And so because Daniel had that gift from God to interpret dreams, Daniel was elevated in the kingdom. Okay? Because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and no secret troubles you. Tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. Thus were the visions of my head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth. Uh, so this is part of the dream. There was a tree. And the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong. And the height thereof reached unto heaven. Now just real quick. I don't know if that terminology kind of like stimulates your brain a little bit. But that it, it does something for me. Where it says that the height of the tree reached up into heaven. I'm not going to try to keep you guessing, but it reminds me of the wording that was used regarding the Tower of Babel. When the Tower of Babel was erected in Genesis chapter 11, they said, come, let us make bricks, let us build our, a name for ourselves, and let us build ourselves a tower that reaches into the heavens. Now, there's some similarities between the Babel event and this, I believe, at least a little bit, because there was a lot, there was a lot of pride involved in what was going on building the Tower of Babel. A lot of pride and opposition against God. A lot of this chapter that we're going to read today is centered on pride. What's going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar is all because he was prideful. And at the same time, this kingdom that he has, which is represented by this tree, is reaching up into the heavens. And we already know that the Babylonian Empire was full of occultic type stuff. So there's that interconnection there. We've already made the point that the Tower of Babel was the beginning point of the Babylonian Empire and that mystery Babylon I know I've said that many times but we're going to keep on repeating that because we want to be familiar with that terminology and we want to be familiar with what those concepts are and I'm hoping that when it's all said and done that y'all will, will be able to see at least what I'm what I'm seeing and what I'm trying to communicate, I'm not saying you're going to all completely agree with me in the end, but I hope that you can at least see what I'm seeing from the scriptures over the last five to seven years that God has started to really open up some of the big picture things about what's going on in the world and things like that, okay? So, in the sight thereof to the end of all the earth, the leaves thereof were fair, the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat or food for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the fowls thereof. So I kind of highlighted, you can see, the fowls of the airport, because we're going to go, we're going to get into a couple of other scriptures, but I think that the fowls of the air, especially in this tree, there's a scripture out of Matthew that sounds very similar, and I'm just going to try to break down for you in a little bit what I believe this to be describing. And all flesh was fed of it. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher. Now, you know, this, we're not going to see this kind of terminology every day. So while we're here, we're going to slow down a little bit. And we're going, to, we're going to mention this. So what is a watcher? Does anybody have a recommendation on that? Anybody want to throw their paw up there and say what they think it is? It's okay. You don't have to. So a watcher is an angel. Okay? Now, listen. This one here says a watcher, a holy one, came down. So what I need you to know is, is that there's also unholy watchers. As a matter of fact, in the book of Enoch, and we've talked about it a little bit, they, what, what the book of Enoch describes, and the book of Enoch is quoted in the Bible, so it's at least worth mentioning. We don't consider it to be canon. I don't consider it to be canon. If God wanted it in the canon, it would be in the canon, because God is sovereign over his word. But nevertheless, 
other biblical writers quoted out of the book of Enoch, Jude quoted out of the book of Enoch, that gives validity to the book of Enoch. Okay, the book of Enoch states, specifically, you remember when we talked about those sons of God, which were fallen angels, cohabiting with the daughters of men? Well, those, the book of Enoch describes that there were specifically 200 watcher angels, now these will be fall, the unholy kind, that descended on Mount Hermon and were specifically involved with engaging in all of this type of behavior. So I just want you to know that the, that the word watcher right here is describing angels. And the context that the word is giving us is that it's a holy watcher. So it's a holy angel in this case, meaning it's an angel of God. He's still on God's side. Then the angel is coming down to give a, a, a message, okay, which oftentimes in the Old Testament, angels gave, gave messages. Even in the New Testament, the angel Gabriel gave a message to Joseph. And, and, and gave messages regarding regarding Jesus. Okay, so I just wanted you to, to know what a watcher was. So then he says, he cried aloud and said, thus, hew down the tree. That's another way for saying cut it down. And cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. So the tree, once again, it represents the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, but it also represents the king. And, and, and by this tree getting cut down, but you'll see it says leave the stump. Now, I've got to tell you, there's other scriptures, and, and, you know, that this is completely kind of shifting gears. But in Isaiah, it talks about that a stump or a root would come out of dry ground. And it would be the offshoot or the offspring of Jesse. And Jesse was David's uh, father, and David was a type of Christ. And so David, and Jesus came from King David's lineage. So that Isaiah passage I'm telling you about, when it talks about a shoot will come forth from Jesse out of dry ground, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about a branch that's going to come out of a stump that looks like it's dead, it's cut down, it's withered, and it looks like it has no hope. But the truth is, is that even though it looked like, uh, you know, whenever Jesus died on the cross, that there was no hope there, or that the children of Israel in the Old Testament, through all of their Babylonian captivity and all the things that happened, it just, it has appeared during times, during certain seasons and times for God's people, that things for, weren't working out the way God would have intended. That's what it appears to the human eye. But God's always working behind the scenes, and he promised that there would be a shoot that would come forth from Jesse. And lo and behold, it happened, amen, that from David's offspring came forth Jesus and that now the kingdom of God has grown significantly through the church age. And many a person has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and has had the opportunity to either reject or to receive him. All right? So it says, let his heart be changed. We're talking about Nebuchadnezzar right now. Let his heart be changed from a man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him. And let seven times pass over him. In other words, this is going to go on for seven years. Something's going to happen to him where his mind is going to, going to evade him. And for seven years, this is going to take place. This matters by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. And get, now, you know, before we get into that, let me, let me just say this right here. Like this, so where it says, by the decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the Holy Ones. One of the things that I want to mention to you is, you may not have ever thought about this before, but there's other scriptures that describe similar <coughs> concepts like this, where it's like, it appears that there's a divine council in heaven, meaning that God has, has these holy angels and that, that there's other created entities, and we don't know, we're not going to know until we get there, but there's enough evidence in the Bible to know that it's not so much God is consulting Angels to get their opinion on things, but instead he utilizes them in his work on earth, just like God uses human beings. Amen? God uses human beings as vessels that he desires to, to use to tell other people about the truth. Amen? And he also uses angels. He uses, and so there's this council in heaven. I mean, I, 
I don't want to get too deep into this because I don't want to get sidetracked, but I can remember one particular scripture, and I read it to y'all recently, where God, you know, listen, sometimes people want to be deceived. Mm -hmm. do, 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 do you realize that? And, and what I mean by that is, is that sometimes people just don't really want the truth of God's word. Like, because, see, when you get into the truth of God's word, it describes to you what God likes and what God hates. I was sharing just the other day uh, at a new job, this a particular physician, he, he started to ask me some questions. Okay, you know, I thought about it all night long. And when I went back to work, he asked me again. I didn't start any of this. Okay, all this stuff was started. Okay, and so what, one of the things that I began to say was this. I said, you know, what, the problem that we have in society, at least in my opinion, you know, not everybody's going to agree with me, but in my opinion is this, we've been misdiagnosed. Yep. Well, what are you talking about? We've been misdiagnosed because we're looking at all the symptoms. We look at addiction. We look at these relationships that fall apart. We look at the anxiety, the panic attacks. We look at all of these things. No, oh, that's just the symptomology. Those are just symptoms of the bigger problem. The root cause of the etiology, the problem, the root cause, the diagnosis is sin. That's it. <laughs> the diagnosis is sin that we receive from our father Adam. But nobody likes to hear that. Nobody, oh, don't you call me a sinner, preacher. I mean, I'm calling myself a sinner. You, you need to hang around long enough to hear what I'm actually saying. I'm calling us, I'm calling us all sinners. Every, every human being has come forth from the loins of Adam. Adam was created in, in a pristine, uh, from pristine soil that was not fallen. You know, and then, you know, some people are going to come out, oh, that's an allegory. No, 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 no. God created Adam and Eve. And he created them in his image and likeness. And then they fell. And when they fell, they took sin into themselves. Then once they had sin into themselves, then now every offspring from Adam and Eve comes forth. Now there's a sinful nature. And the problem that we have on earth today is that we have all these voices that are trying to tell us what love looks like. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? They try to tell us what love looks like. You know, true love is accepting of everyone. Listen, I want to accept everyone. I want to love everyone. But the reality of it is, is that if God's word says that it's sin, then it's sin. Preach it. And the truth is this, is that if I don't tell somebody what God's word says, then I don't really love them. See, this is the thing. Whenever you were growing up, did your mom and your daddy correct you? Okay, then you don't have to raise your hand. But, but listen, and this, there's a fine line between a proper kind of correction and a wrong kind of correction. Some people, like, you know, they get joy out of beating on people. That, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the love of a father that would love his children enough to try to bring correction in their life. You know, I mean, listen, if you got a little child that's a three-year-old kid and he just, he's like a little hellion and he does whatever he wants, he just goes in there and he rips the cereal box open and he's like slings cereal all over the place and he pours milk on the floor and he grabs your phone and he slings it across the room and you don't ever correct him because you don't want to have to deal with his screaming. Are you really doing the right thing for that child? No. Because they, that kid's going to grow up and he's going to be what they used to call him cordial. Or, which means that he, there's no hope for him. Society can't, can't benefit. He's not a benefit to society. We've got to lock him up. So a, the, a lot of a true parent, it, even though it's difficult sometimes, I get that. It's difficult sometimes, but the love of a true parent is going to raise their children and correct their children and, 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 and try to mold their children in the right direction. Well, God does the same God does the same to his children. He corrects them. His word tells us what he desires for mankind. We speak forth the truth of his word. The Holy Spirit mixes with the word of God and convicts us in our heart and in our lives when there's things that aren't right. Amen? And so that's, that's what the word of God is to do. So, But the world is saying something different. The world is saying, oh no, YOLO, baby. You only live once. Or, you know, something like that. You know, you just got to go ahead and live for today, man. You only got one life. Live for today. Get everything you can out of it. Okay? But the problem is, is that sin creates more sin 
creates more pain, creates more frustrating circumstances. Can I get a witness in here? Amen. Amen. I know y'all tired. I know it's hot out there, but come on, somebody help me out. Y'all know that every time we make decisions that bring us in the wrong way, it ends up more painful. Come on, help me out. God's just wanting us to surrender, amen, and to submit to his will. Okay, we kind of went off. But here, to the intent that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whosoever he will. This, this terminology is utilized at least three times in this chapter. That God gives kingdoms to whoever he sees fit. See, Nebuchadnezzar is getting a revelation of this. Nebuchadnezzar thought he was the one that caused his kingdom to be like a tree that rose into heaven. He thought he was the one that had built all of this. And he had become very prideful. And God's not going to share his glory with another. And so it says that God gives it to whomsoever he will and sets up over it the basis or the lowliest of men. <clears throat> this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, O Belteshazzar, that's his, his, his Daniel's uh, Babylonian name, declare the interpretation thereof. For as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but you are able. For the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was a stony or uh, kind of like caught up in a, in a, in a daze for about, a, for about an hour. His thoughts troubled him. The king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble you. Belteshazzar answered and said, my lord, the dream be to them that hate thee. So he had enemies. But listen, the dream is for all of us to understand also what God what God does with pride, okay? And the interpretation thereof to your enemies. The tree that you saw, which grew and was strong, whose height reached into the heavens, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was food for all under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls or the birds of the heaven had their habitation. It is you, O king. You are grown and become strong, for your greatness is grown, and reaches into heaven, and your dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher or an angel and a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Cut the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass and the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, Seven times, meaning for seven years, that would pass over. This is the interpretation of king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King, that they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you to eat grass as oxen. They shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. Seven years will pass over you, till you know that the Most High... So this is going to go on until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whosoever he will. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, your kingdom shall be sure unto you. In other words, it's not going to be completely destroyed. After you have known that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto you, and break off your sins by righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of your tranquility. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spoke and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from you, and they shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you to eat grass as oxen for seven years shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws, 
And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. See, man's kingdoms are temporary. God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Look at that. I just want you to see this because this is a big part of what, what, what I think we need to focus on. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. God's will is going to prevail. Sometimes it might look like God's will is not prevailing or winning. Because we look at the world. We look at the chaos. We look at the confusion. We look at all the things going on. We look at people blaspheming God. Nobody seems to be reverent towards God anymore. All of, and all of the confusion. But I'm here to tell you that God is not taken by surprise. God knows exactly what's going on. And he has allowed, almost like a master chess player, to allow various pieces on the board to be moved in certain directions. Even when it comes to leadership of human beings that rise up over nations, God is not caught by surprise, church. I want you to know that. Even whenever you start digging and you start realizing that this world is not exactly what you thought it was, that this nation is not exactly what you thought it was, I got good news. God is still in control, and he is aware of everything that's going on. I can promise you he's not up there stressing out and biting his fingernails. God knows what's happening. His word already dictates to us what is going to take place. Amen? Amen. And he goes on to say that none can stay his hand or say unto him, what do you do? At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned unto me. My counselors and my words sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the kingdom of heaven, all whose works are truth, in his ways, judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to obey. So look at that. Let's just look at that one more time. Those that walk in pride, he is able to abase or lower or bring to a place of humility. Listen, if mankind wants to walk in pride, God knows how to get a hold of it. God knows how to break him down. God knows how to, to humble his heart. Amen. Amen. And I want, and I, and I, I want to focus on that, on that, that just for a minute because that is one of the bigger themes that I find in this particular chapter. Pride. His kingdom had risen up like a tree into the heavens. It, it, it was it was it was spread out as far as the eye could see. His kingdom fed the fed multiple people were able to eat off of his kingdom. His empire was great, but he took credit for. You know, there's a scripture in the book of Acts where King Herod did the same thing. Where they, they screamed in the book of Acts, he is the voice of a God, he's not a man. But he refused to give glory to God. And the Bible says that right then and there, the angel of the Lord smote him and he was ate over worms. A very con similar con concept is going on here. One of the things that I want you to know, because we're talking about end times, and we're ultimately preparing to get to the book of Revelation, is that I want you to know that the Antichrist, because look, Nebuchadnezzar is a type of the Antichrist. Yes, in this story, he was humble. Yes, in this story, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he recognized God. But Nebuchadnezzar is also, before this time, when he's humbled, a type of Antichrist. The way that he besieged Jerusalem. The way that he took Daniel and the other boys back to Babylon. The way that he tried to get them to compromise. We talked about that. The Antichrist is going to try to get the people of God to compromise. Okay, and, and within this kingdom that he has, this Babylonian kingdom, we need to understand that that is a big part of the end time, you know, things that are that are taking place. So pride is, is one of the is one of the first things that 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 uh, sticks out to me in this particular uh, story. And you know, just just to go ahead and and to give you a. Uh, Something personal to lead with because a lot of this that I'm about to get into has more to do with the big plan 
regarding the end times, but I want to, I, I know I've already shared with you a little, few things that I think can minister to you personally, but I want you to see this scripture because I'm a pride man. And one of the things that I want you to see that happened to Nebuchadnezzar is because of the pride that was in him, he kind of like lost his mind. That was part of, that was part of God's rebuke on him. Now, that was an extreme case, right? I mean, it's, the Bible says he was out there in the field crawling around eating grass. His fingernails were growing like claws. Okay? Um, he was literally, he had literally become insane. All right? Now, but I want you to know this. I want you to know that there's differing levels of kind of like losing your mind a little bit. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Like not everybody's going to crawl around in the dude and grow, grow, you know, their hair starts looking like eagle feathers and their fingernails start getting long. But listen, pride can cause confusion in your mind. I need you to understand that. Pride can cause confusion in your mind and it can start to warp your way of thinking. Pride will cause you and I to think that we're okay when in reality we're not okay. Does that make sense? I'm talking about even people in the church. We allow ourselves to get spiritually prideful and we think that we're okay, but really and truly we can't see ourselves for the way that the Lord would have us to be able to see ourselves. Now it's important that you understand that none of us are perfect. We all fall short of the glory of God. We're all a work in progress. Amen? But one thing that I will tell you that I desire to have is a teachable spirit. I don't want to be an unteachable person. I want to, I want to have a soft heart that's willing to hear, you know, from the Lord, from his word, even from other people, if the Lord's going to use other people. Because, listen, pride will give you an unteachable spirit. So look what this scripture says in James. It says, you adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Now, that scripture is pretty strong. One of the things that I need you to know is this, though, is that sometimes we might be more friends with the world than what we realize. Mm -hmm. It's easy for us to sit in the church and, like, you know, I'm not picking on the Bible. We'll shake our head. Yep, yep, that's right, preacher. Get on. Get on, preacher. And they love the world and wretched sinners. But the reality of it is, is that every last one of us, to some extent, whether we realize it or not, we're pulled by the world. The world has an influence, man, whether it comes through the commercials and the music we listen to or the ads that we see, and it has a way of drawing us in, okay? I'm not trying to say that you can't buy nice stuff. That's not even what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say whenever the motives and the, the mindset starts looking at the world and the, what the world is doing, and we start saying, man, that is really cool. But in reality, it's wicked, Amen. And, it's, and it's bringing destruction. And it's, and it's causing confusion? No, that's not cool. Because now we're contrary to the word of God. Or we're in opposition to the word of God. The Lord says, did you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, that's a hard word, but I didn't write it. James wrote it. The Lord's brother wrote it. The Holy Spirit told him to write it. Yet God wants you and I to know that friendship with the world is enmity with God, meaning that it causes, it causes a, a break between our relationship with the Lord. Amen? And you're going to have to try to study and figure out what you think God means by the world. The world's got a whole lot to offer, my friend. But guess what? It's not going to leave you happy. It's going to leave you empty. All right? And then he goes on to say this. Do you think that the scripture says in vain that the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy? Now, that word lust can be confusing because the word lust can actually mean something good depending on the context. So in this context, the lust is the lust of the Holy Spirit. It means, the word really means a desire. What it's saying is that the Holy Spirit has a desire for you he has a desire for you, he has a desire for you, and he has a desire for me. The Holy Spirit has a desire that he would have your heart, that he would have my heart. He doesn't want the world to have our heart. He doesn't want the ways of the world to pull us away from him. Instead, he wants you and I to be in right relationship with him and to want the things of God. All right? So the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit's desiring or lusting after you and I. And wanting us not to go lusting after the ways of the world. And he goes on to say this, but he gives more grace, wherefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now look, I, I gotta tell you this. 
a lot of times what happens is though is that even sometimes whenever the preacher's preaching, I know because like dude, like sometimes I'm reading the word of God and I'm like, man, I didn't like that. I didn't like the way I felt. <laughs> what are you talking about? Because I was in rebellion against God. Come on, somebody. Hey, hey, we're awake tonight. We listen. Whenever that's the whole purpose in getting into the word of the Lord. When we get into the word of God, God wants to rebuke us. He wants to chastise us. He wants to show us when there's things in our heart and in our lives that aren't lining up. And the way that it's supposed to happen is we see the word of the Lord. He convicts us in our life of things that are going on. And then we're like, Lord, I can't get rid of this on my own. I need you to put the cross on that. Amen? What do you mean? Kill that in me, Lord, and allow resurrection life to take its place. Allow the fruit of the Spirit to take its place. But listen, sometimes whenever we see it in the Word or the preacher preaches something, I'm just saying, like, you know, I don't know. I'm trying to think of something to irritate me when I've heard that say. You know, oh, you, you know, listen, brother, you know, you're a believer now. You can't be listening to Vince Neal sing about getting in the saddle with people and taking a swig of whiskey anymore. You know, and, and, and I'm like, well, wait, hold on a second, dude, you can't, you know, you, you know, I mean, in my flesh, my flesh, you get riled up, okay, because I, I do what I want to do, man, you don't tell me what to do, no, that's pride, sorry, that's pride, if you feel that way, that's pride, if, it, if, if something in our life is contrary to the word of the living God, and it's, and it's proclaimed, and it's right there written on the page, or the Holy Spirit dealing with me, because listen, it ain't godly for Vince Neal to be singing about hopping in the saddle with somebody and taking a swig of whiskey. He's not talking about some marital love thing going on with his wife. He's talking about some backstage girl that he, whatever the case. And listen, it's not of the Lord. Amen. Okay? But the ways of the world, boy, they make it look all pretty. It's just like a Christmas tree with all the bling on it. Make it look all pretty. It seems so cool. And it's the spirit of the world that's behind it. Amen? So the pride in us will tell us, no, I'm going to rise up, I'm going to rebel, I'm going to go against God. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Every last one of you in here at some point in time, you rebel against your parents at some point in time. Lord knows I was a rebel. And it's the same thing whenever we hear the voice of the Lord or we read the word of God and we rebel against God's word. But he gives grace to the home. So that's the difference, man. We gotta humble ourselves, amen. That's just that's a good word tonight. I just want to share that with you. It's a good word, Lord. Let us humble ourselves. Amen. Give us the grace that we need in order to humble ourselves. He goes on to say this: Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Amen. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Amen. All right. So look, a couple of things that I wanted to kind of mention real quick. Matthew chapter thirteen. Um, the, regarding, regarding the fowl of the air, remember how the tree, going back to our story, how the tree had reached up into the heavens and the birds lived in the branches? You know, one of the things that it reminded me of was this scripture in Matthew 13, 4, about the parable of the sower. In the parable of the sower, some of the seed landed on the side of the road, okay, which it wasn't really intended to be there, and there was no way for the seed to get in. So the seed represents the word of God. The seed represents the word of God being planted in the heart, which is supposed to be the soil, and that it would produce fruit in the life. Well, some of the seed fell on the wayside, and look what it says in verse 4. When he sowed, some seeds fell on the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. So the word fowls, or birds of the air, are many times used to describe evil, later on the interpretation of this parable, is that these are evil spirits that are trying to steal the word of God. Now I've got to tell you, we're not going to turn there, but there's also a scripture in Genesis 15. Whenever God made his covenant with Abraham. When God made his covenant with Abraham, Abraham cut a bunch of animals in two and spread them on the side because that's how they used to cut covenant. They would offer those sacrifices up. He cut a bunch of animals and he split them in two. And then for a moment, he, he got... He got ready to, to, to sit down and a bunch of fowl, a bunch of birds came upon the carcasses trying to steal it. Listen, that's exactly what the enemy's always doing. He's always trying to mess up the covenant that God has provided for his people. We understand in the New Testament that that covenant found its fulfillment in Jesus and what he did for us when he died on the cross. The word covenant means an agreement. God has an agreement with sinful man. Sinful man can't cleanse himself. Sinful man is separated from God. Sinful man must humble himself 
and, re and believe by faith the sacrifice of Jesus, what he did for us at the cross, and now our hearts and lives can be restored unto God. But I wanted you to see this fowls of the earth. Now listen, there's also the same, in the same chapter, there's another scripture, uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse uh, 32. Now this one, this, this is talking about the mustard seed. So the kingdom of God is likened to a mustard seed, which is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs. It becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. You see the similarity between the story of this tree and its branches and the birds to the story of the tree that we talked about in Daniel. The main thing I want you to see is this. I know that this is getting kind of deep, but just bear with me. I'm not going to keep you much longer. That these fowls, I believe, constantly represent the forces of evil. And what I want you to know is this, is that even within the kingdom of God, there, listen, there's, there's evil in the air. Is it, is it okay if I say it that way? In other words, there, you, you can flip on the channel, this is just an example, and you might be watching some preacher on television. And I'm not going to say any names tonight because I just don't feel like it. But what, but what I'm saying is, is that you got a preacher up there, and, and you know he might be saying, just plant your $1,000 seed offering, and you're going to get your $40,000 back, okay? Well, the problem is, is this, is that, no, sorry, this isn't a spiritual lottery. You're, you're not supposed to be giving to God in order to get back. Yes, the Word of God does say that. It says it in Malachi chapter 3. Test me in this. See that I will not open up a window of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you're not even able to contain. So yes, it's true. The Lord of God clearly says to us that we can't outgive God. But if he, but if a preacher behind a, a, a TV screen, a camera, is over here telling people to give money as though it's some spiritual lottery and that they were automatically going to get some kind of return on their money, that is that is a lying preacher. And what I'm trying to say is that's evil in the midst of God's kingdom. Amen. So even though even though the kingdom of God is flourishing and it started off as a small little mustard seed, but it grew big enough, the fowl of the air are still able to dwell within that place. Now, with that being said, I want you to know in our story, God, God the, the word the word that was spoken to Nebuchadnezzar was this: You're going to realize, and you're going to come to the truth that God's going to raise up who He chooses to raise up. He's going to raise up the kingdoms that He chooses to raise up, and and He is sovereign over the earth and everything that's happening on the earth. God is not taken by surprise. God said, "I can bring this kingdom down. I can bring this kingdom up." Amen. Now, one of the things that I have mentioned, and I'm about to close for you here in a second, one of the things that I've been mentioning periodically through this, through this series is about the concept of mystery battle, right? And I've been trying to really get that point across, and I'm going to give you like another little piece of information tonight that I hope helps kind of maybe bring about some understanding. So listen, again, we've got to remember, there was a literal kingdom known as God. That's what we read about tonight in our story in Daniel. The king at the time was Nebuchadnezzar. I've already said it many times that he's a type of the Antichrist, the way that he went and got Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and brought all those Hebrew boys back to Babylon. That's and, and, and in, in chapter two, in chapter three last week, we, we saw that he built an image. You remember that? There was an image that was built, a golden image. It was 60 feet high, 6 feet wide, and there were six musical instruments. 666. Six, six. Said when the music starts playing, bow down and worship this image. And I connected you back to Revelation chapter 13 when the Antichrist is going to show up. They're going to build an image and they're going to say, Worship the image of the beast. And all those that do not worship him and do not receive a mark in their right hand or their forehead, they will have to die. Just like Nebuchadnezzar said, if you don't fall down and you don't worship me, you will have to die. So he was a type of of Antichrist, and, we'll, and, we're, and we're seeing all of these things uh, played out and all of that. So, but what I want you to know is this, is that God allowed, so Babylon was a literal empire, all right? And many people believe that the Babylonian empire is going to have to be rebuilt. Under Saddam Hussein, he tried it. He built one gate, the, the gate of Ishtar, which is where we get the word Ish, Easter, and then that was it. It was done. Okay, there ain't no rebuilding Babylon. I do not believe that a literal Babylon has to be rebuilt to fulfill end time prophecy. And let me tell you why, because I've been explaining, trying to explain to you this concept of mystery 
Babylon. It describes it in Revelation 17 and in Revelation 18. I keep saying it, but I want you to get it in your head and in your heart. Revelation 17 and 18, Mystery Babylon. It's a mixture of false religion that has caused people to be deceived and corrupt governments. Again, the rise and fall of human empires that cause, that cause deception, that bring people in bondage. And then in Revelation 18, it describes financial Babylon. And financial Babylon will be destroyed. So really and truly, I guess if I was going to, I didn't bring a little pencil tonight, but I'd probably draw a pyramid. And I would say, find, uh, I would say, false religious Babylon, governmental Babylon, financial Babylon. It's a three-headed monster that is in existence right now, today. All right? You, you're going to have to take my word for it. You're gonna, you can go home and you need to do your own research. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that the enemy has utilized people as vessels and that there has been a very methodical move towards bringing this Babylonian system, spiritually speaking, to cause confusion and deception. Leaders of nations are part of it. Did y'all watch the video yet? The five-hour video with yeah. all the signs and the symbols and all that stuff going on, all that masonry stuff. Listen, dude, if you can if you watch that five-hour video and you see picture after picture after picture after picture after picture after picture after picture of all these people doing these handshakes and all these people doing these weird signs, you know, with their eyes and their hands. And I mean you see Michael Jackson doing the same sign that the Beatles did, and then you see T Justin Timber. We're like doing it. Come on, dude. We're talking about a 50 year span of the stuff, the people doing the same thing. Something's up with that, dude. They're not just trying to like, like trying to mess with our head. No, there's something up with that. It, it, it's a, it's the symbology that they utilize to communicate with themselves. And Freemasonry is just one aspect of that. Okay, and you gotta, you would have to watch. But, but all of this stuff has been going on. People that are in the highest places of government officials are part of that system. Come on, man. All you got to do is just do a little bit of research, my friend. All you got to do is get up in there and get George W. Bush Jr. and you're Skull and Bones. There you go. It's on video. Skull and Bones. Just give you a little Google search and you'll see. He's part of that. His daddy was part of that. His daddy's daddy was part of that. And interconnected to all kinds of other stuff. And, it, and it, so that's just one example. That's just one example. There's multiple examples. Well, why are you talking like that? Because, dude, we're, people have been deceived. And there's a system, the Babylonian mystery system, mystery Babylon. It's this big old huge entity that the enemy has created. Just like the church, God moves through the church. The enemy has created this entity that he's been moving through. And much of it has to do with this financial aspect, too. And as a matter of fact, that's what I'm going to close I want, I want, because, listen, the story tonight was about the fact that God allows empires to rise and he allows empires to fall. And I want you to know that sometimes, whenever I look at what's going on in the world, this is the best way I know how to describe it, it reminds me of the Truman Show with Jim Carrey. <laughs> Did you ever see that show? Yeah. What, what the Truman Show with Jim Carrey is, is that he's just like walking down the street, I don't remember what he was wearing, maybe a Argyle socks, and he's whistling in the neighborhood he lives in, has white picket fences, and all of his life, he's like a young adult now, and then he ends up walking into a wall one day, and, and all, then they show you all the producers behind the scene. Oh my God, oh my God, he, he, he's going to find us out, he's going to find us out. So basically, he was raised in this fake neighborhood. <laughs> and, 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 and that's kind of like, I'm not trying to say that we're really in that, but what I am trying to say is, is that media can manipulate us, yep. and that they can create an alternate reality that we think, you know, or they can tell us whatever they want to tell us. They can lay, listen, dude. They can lay people out, and, and, and I'm not saying that this stuff isn't going on in Afghanistan because I believe that it is. But what I'm trying to say is, if the media wanted to cause confusion, how easy would it be to just set up a scene and they film things and they make us think certain things? I know what you people are like, oh, dude, he's really a conspiracy theorist. He's really getting into this. Okay, well, so maybe I am. But I want to just leave you with this one concept. All right. I was, uh, so I'm talking about the empires. Nebuchadnezzar's empire was cut down, but God allowed it. He said that he would allow it to, to rise again. God is sovereign over the, the kingdoms of the earth. Amen? What I, wanted, what I wanted you to know was one day, 
when I was first studying all this stuff, I uh, I heard I had been studying about this family called the Rothschilds. Okay, if you've never heard about the Rothschilds, you need to go home and you need to do your research. Spend a few days on that. The Rothschild banking dynasty. Okay, and so I had just like and then, then the idea behind it is is that they're basically. There's some very prominent families in the world that are considered Luciferians. Do what you want. I do know this. I know Jesus brought, I know, I'm sorry, Satan brought Jesus upon the mountaintop and he showed them the kingdoms of the earth and he said, all you got to do is bow down and worship me and I'll give you all. Now we know he's a liar, but at the same time that does describe the fact that he has power on earth. And he has power to give power to men. And he has power to, you, to cause men to move in a certain direction. So I'm learning about this Rothschild dynasty, and there's other people, the Rockefellers are involved in all of this, according to the information that you can find. But at, at this point in time, I'm very like new to this concept of this Rothschild thing. So we go on vacation to Gulf Shores, from what I remember, this is probably eight years ago, and we come back through, and there's this flea market. I'm like, hey, let's go and check out this flea market. So I go to the book section, and I'm looking around, and I see this book called whatever, a history of the Jews. It was a big old encyclopedia. And so I flipped through it, and I kind of just was looking at the index in the back, and it said the Rothschild, and it had a certain page on there. And so I said, hold on, let me buy this book. It was like $3, and this, and I don't know, hey, somebody out there has my book, bring it back to me. <laughs> uh, encyclopedia of the Jews. All right, so I started reading this book, and lo and behold, boy, this threw me for a loop, guys, but I'm sharing it with you, because listen, I can't protect you from the real world that you live in anymore. There's no time to protect you anymore. Can't, we can't power each other's bums. We gotta tell the truth, okay? And, and, and we just gotta know. We gotta know what's going on. Alright? So I, I start reading the book. Well, lo and behold, there was something called a Balfour Declaration that took place in 1917. You can go ahead and you can read it for yourself and you can double check me to make sure. There was a very prominent man that had a lot to do with this Balfour Declaration. He was a Rothschild. Now listen, by this time, the Rothschild family had already taken over the Bank of England. The Federal Reserve Bank does not belong to the United States of America, my friend. Newsflash. This whole banking industry is owned by these families that I'm trying to tell you about. And it's, the information is out there. It's not hard at all to find, okay? Well, so the, this Rothschild man was very instrumental in bringing back the Jewish state that we currently see that's in existence today. See, if you don't know much about history, you don't know where we've been and we don't know where we're going. Now, why would somebody like that try so hard to bring back a Jewish state? Listen, there was a time frame. Israel did not become a nation again until 1945. Israel is in the Bible. We have evidence that Israel was a nation. It was a great nation. It was a prospering nation. But then God allowed them to go under what we were reading in Daniel, Babylonian captivity, Persian captivity. Then Alexander the Great, we've already talked about him, came through. We're going to talk about him more. Hellenized the Western world. And then the Roman Empire rose up. Jesus was born in the midst of the Roman Empire. But listen, they still were not a true Jewish state. And then as time went by, it got even worse because the Ottoman Empire came into existence and, the, and the, 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 the religion of Islam came into existence and there was all this fighting going on and the Jewish people were spread out all over the place. And that little strip of land that we call Israel now was known as Palestine. But under the British Empire, after the Ottoman Empire, this guy, Rothschild, started buying up property and started sending people back into the homeland of the Jewish people. And then he received a letter from a man named Balfour, and that was the beginning stages of reinstituting the nation of Israel into what we currently see today. Now that brings a whole lot of prophecy into existence. Do you understand what I'm saying? With, with, now with the city of Jerusalem there and the ability to possibly rebuild the temple, this allows for all kinds of prophecy to be fulfilled in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Matthew chapter 24, Revelation 13, where the Antichrist will exalt himself 
and demand to be worshipped <coughs> from a wing of the temple. Jesus said that it's going to happen. But as long as there was not a Jewish nation in existence that allowed it to happen, then it could never happen. Now this Jewish nation is in existence. Now, can I tell you, what did I say about the Rothschild? I said that the, that the information out there says they're losing. Yep. Now, what, now, what does that do to you? Because no. it kind of jacked me up a little bit for a little while. But I got to tell you something. See, mm -hmm. Daniel, the reason I said it was because Daniel 4 tells us about it. Daniel 4 tells us, Nebuchadnezzar, don't be confused. You think you're a great man? You think your kingdom is great? You think that you're like this tree that has reached up into the heavens? But well, let me tell you something. Your pride is about to make you go crazy. God is going to humble you. <clears throat> number seven is God's number of completion, God's number of fulfillment. He will bring it to pass. God lowered Nebuchadnezzar, and God allowed this whole thing, this nation called Israel, to come into existence. It don't matter to me whether who this man is or what he thinks he's doing or what his family, they're still alive. Listen, I can show you the picture. I think I can. I don't know where my library is. Look, here she is. She's one of these, she's one of these people. Look at that necklace she got on right there. She's one of these raw child people. You can't see it too good. That's the devil right there. This woman is wearing a necklace of the devil. This is a multi-billionaire woman right here. Listen, here she is right here. It's a goat head. It's a goat head that she's wearing. Come on, man. Where's a goat head like that? No. And listen, and there's other there's other people. This is just this is just one. She just flaunts her stuff. You know, and, and then there's other women that were part of this wall child dynasty and family where they found that they had these weird <coughs> death collection of all this death. Listen. I'm just trying to make a point to you that this is very integral, that there's, there's wicked men working a plan on the earth. I just need you to know that. That's what I'm calling Mystery Babylon. Financial Babylon, Revelation 18, that's connected to this whole banking industry. What I'm trying to say is that God is going to bring it to an end. Yes. And they have a plan, but they don't understand that they're like little puppets in the hand of God. And yes, they may be making moves, but God says, I am sovereign over the earth. I, I bring people low. I raise people up. I'm performing my will upon the earth. Man might think he's performing his will on the earth. Man working in conjunction with the dragon might think he's accomplishing something on the earth. But the reality of it is, is that God is sovereign and in control, and he knows exactly what's going on, and he is going to bring his will to pass. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us, Lord God, that you give us wisdom, that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And I pray, oh Lord, that you would help us. Help us, oh Lord, to be able to see what the, the, the sign of the times and the seasons that we're in. And Lord, for our individual walk, spiritually speaking, Lord, I pray that you would help to cause pride to die. And that you would help us, Lord, to embrace humility. For your word says that you resist the proud, but you give grace to the humble. Therefore, we desire to humble ourselves under your mighty name, that in due time you may exalt us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen.